Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back. In this video, we're going to be looking at the Unit 3 March 2024 examination pre-release case study. And we're going to start with case study 1. I'm going to read through each paragraph, then I'll analyse it for you. So let's start. It starts on page 3. Case study 1. Keith is 43, lives alone in his two-bedroom house in Bedfordshire, and works for a financial services firm in training and development. Keith has a net monthly pay of £3,000. So, the fact he's 43, he's at the mature adult stage of the life cycle, he lives alone, and therefore we can assume that he's got no dependents uh, that we're aware of, nothing in the case study gives us any indication of that anyway, and he lives in a two-bedroom house. Some may say this is excess actually to Keith's needs, but it also gives him the opportunity to potentially rent a room if he is short of cash. Keith works for a financial services firm, and therefore we would expect Keith to have a good understanding of the financial industry. He has a net monthly pay of 3000 Now, net is, of course, after deductions such as tax and national insurance have actually been made. And a net monthly pay of 3000 means that he's getting, after tax, £36,000 per year. Keith has six years left to finish paying off his mortgage, with monthly payments of £900, and his existing pension planning will allow him to retire at 60. Keith lives a comfortable life and always ensures his mandatory payments are made. Keith has always written down his budget plans at the start of every month, adding to his savings whenever possible at the end of every month. Keith has had a £1,000 overdraft facility on his current account for many years, without needing to use it. Keith has also previously considered getting a credit card, but never had the need for one. So he's six years left to finish paying off his mortgage, so he'll be able to do that by age 49. Of course, he's 43 at the moment. The, mean, the fact that he's got a mortgage, of course, means that he's committed every single month to making those monthly payments, and his monthly payments are £900, which equates to 30% of his net monthly pay. He will be able to retire at 60 with his existing pension planning, which is 17 years away, and he lives a comfortable life. This suggests that a significant amount of his net pay is spent on discretionary expenditure. Now, Keith's £1,000 overdraft facility has existed for many years, but he hasn't actually needed to use it. This is good because there's no interest to pay, but of course it might actually harm his credit rating, the fact that he's not actually borrowing any money, with the exception of his mortgage. And the fact is, because he's making those repayments on his mortgage, we can assume that his credit rating is relatively good. Keith has also previously considered getting a credit card, but never actually had the need for one probably due to his budgeting. Keith had £2,000 in a separate savings account until recently, when a series of unexpected events, all within one month, meant that he needed to access his savings. So the fact he'd got £2,000 in a separate savings account means that Keith accrued interest on that savings, which is beneficial. But some would suggest that £2,000 in a savings account, potentially to be used uh, in as a contingency fund, would be too little. I mean, at the end of the day, it's equivalent to just two-thirds of one month's net pay. And therefore, some may suggest he needs considerably more, uh, just in case unexpected events, like we'll come on to, to read, um, all happen in one month. Maybe it might have been worth Keith considering actually whether he should have used his savings or indeed his overdraft. As we know, he's had a £1,000 overdraft facility on his current account for many years and not actually used it. It might be worth considering at this stage the benefits and the drawbacks of using overdrafts against savings. The fourth paragraph. Keith had an issue with his boiler that needed £1,000 worth of repairs, which he paid for with money from his savings account. Keith's brother got into some financial difficulty, and he used the remaining savings to help his brother. Keith's brother intends to pay, repay him with his next month's salary. Keith's car then broke down, and he needed £800 for the repairs as he needs his car to travel to work. Keith used his overdraft facility to pay for the repairs, with the intention of repaying this as soon as possible. 
So Keith had an issue with his boiler that needed a thousand pounds of repairs. That essentially is his overdraft limit, a thousand pounds. Keith's brother got into some financial difficulty and he used his remaining savings to help his brother. So he's used £1,000 um, of his savings and then used the remaining savings, which obviously he had £2,000 to help his brother. We assume, therefore, he used £1,000 to help his brother. His brother intends to repay him with next month's salary. Only without this money for a short time, therefore, Keith will only be without it for for a month. Keith's car then broke down, he obviously wasn't having the best month, and he needed £800 for the repairs as he needs his car to travel to work. So that makes the car a pretty important thing, and therefore he needed that money ASAP to spend on the repairs. He used his overdraft facility to repay for the repairs and once again it might be worth just noting the benefits and drawbacks of using overdraft facilities. He did have the intention of repaying this as soon as possible. Of course we don't know whether that actually happened or not. The next paragraph begins, in previous months, Keith had intended on limiting his spending and increasing his savings, but he is now £800 overdrawn. He has decided that while he could try his best to repay the overdraft, he needs a more concrete plan to do this. So, he'd intended on limiting his spending and increasing his savings. This suggests that it didn't actually happen. We need to ask the question why. Potentially was it because he was spending too much on discretionary expenditure? It mentions earlier on in the case study that Keith lived a very comfortable life. So that could be a possibility. It suggests he needs a more concrete plan uh, to actually repay the overdraft. So what could actually go into that plan? Well, potentially reducing his expenditure, as we've just discussed. He could also look to increase his income. He works for a financial services firm and has net monthly pay of 3000 We wonder whether, of course, there might be the opportunity to gain promotion or indeed ask for a pay rise. Another option, of course, is envelope budgeting, and there's more on envelope budgeting later on in the case study. Keith has reviewed his budget, calculated his disposable income, and is using envelope budgeting for his expenditure. Keith believes that if he reverts to physical cash, this will help him to see what he is spending, as he feels he does not monitor his spending when he uses, well, when he pays using a contactless card. So envelope budgeting pops up in this case study several times and is potentially a major theme for questioning. Worth knowing exactly what envelope budgeting is, as well as the benefits and potential drawbacks. Now, he feels he does not monitor his spending when he pays using a contactless card once again could be a big theme of this case study and potential questioning. So know the benefits and the drawbacks of using contactless payment cards. However, when Keith visited his local supermarket to pay for his first weekly shopping with cash, he was told that they only accept card payments. This could, of course, limit Keith's ability to use envelope budgeting, which, of course, is a negative of that type of budgeting. Let's turn to page number four. This is the beginning of the research section. The first article considers the rising use of cash, as some people find it easier to control when they are trying to balance finances against cost of living concerns. These cost of living concerns caused by high inflation, especially if wages remain the same or don't keep pace with the increased inflation. The research section starts with this headline. Cash popular again due to cost of living concerns, says Post Office. Post Office branches handled increased amounts of cash in August 2022 as banks close branches and the cost of living bites. This was especially high due, during that period. The very high levels of inflation really meant that the cost of living increased. It says it expects the trend to continue due to rising living costs and tighter budgets. Some people say they find it easier to monitor spending by using notes and coins rather than electronic payments. Of course, with electronic payments, you might lose track of your spending. 
During the worst of the pandemic, all transactions fell, but cash use dropped particularly sharply as shopkeepers preferred contactless methods. Contactless being, of course, during the pandemic, it restricted the spread of the virus. We expect cash transactions to continue to exceed expectations in October and for the rest of the year, said Martin Kersley, banking director at the post office. But while the post office is processing more cash transactions in the short term, over the long term the trend away from cash is set to continue. With UK Finance, the body representing the banking industry, forecasting cash will account for only 6% of payments by 2031. Only 6% of payments. That means that financial institutions have really got to consider whether they continue to accept cash or not. And that might also be a theme for questioning. The use of notes and coins has already fallen dramatically over the last decade from 55% of payments in 2011 to just 15% 10 years later in 2021. Remember, it was forecasted to fall to 6% by 2031. Let's move on to page number 5. So, page number five begins with this graph, how we are changing the way we pay. Cash and debit card payments and forecasts for 2011 to 2031. We can see in this table, which the source is UK Finance and it's from the BBC, that the use of cash has dropped sharply uh, since 2011. And as we can see, the predictions for the next, well, seven years at least, are that it will continue to fall. Whereas on the other hand, debit card spending has increased significantly over the same period from just roughly 7.5 billion to almost 25 billion in that time period. We can see actually, however, that during the Corona pandemic, uh, just in the 2020 2021 period, spending using both debit cards and cash dropped significantly. We have to remember, however, that forecasting may be inaccurate and it might not always be the case that these trends continue. Let's look at the next article then. The next article looks at how some retailers are no longer accepting cash since the increase of not allowing the use of cash during the COVID-19 pandemic. The headline begins, one in five shoppers blocked from paying with cash. One in five, of course, equivalent to 20%. A fifth of shoppers have been turned away when trying to pay with cash since lockdown rules eased. A survey by which the consumer group found that 18% of consumers had been unable to pay with cash at least once when trying to buy something between April and July of 2021. Of those who had their cash payment refused, one in six were then unable to complete their purchase. This means that 18% were unable to pay with cash, equivalent to one in six, i.e. three were unable to complete the purchase out of 100 people. This comes despite some 8 in 10, 80%, consumers thinking businesses and shops should continue to accept cash. Let's turn to page number six. Page number six begins, younger generations also rely on cash. A study by the FCA found that nearly a quarter of people aged 18 to 24 had struggled to cope with businesses shunning cash. This is equivalent to 25%, and this might be because they're less able to access or even understand alternative payment methods. The source for that information was the telegraph.co.uk, which is of course a newspaper, and obviously an online newspaper these days. The next article looks at how cash is becoming popular again and the issues around legal tender. The headline begins, Cash Provides a Degree of Control. Linda Blacker in Southampton and Joanne Houston in Brighton contacted Witch Money after they were unable to pay for their bus fares in cash. Joanne says cash has helped her to manage the financial hardships of the pandemic. I was reduced to furlough payments and my husband, who works as a taxi driver, had no income whatsoever. 
So the way we managed our finances was that the money we left in the bank account was for bills and we withdrew the rest to live off so we could carefully control how we spent it. So, Joanne says she was reduced to furlough payments. If we remember, these were the payments given to employees when they were unable to work during the pandemic. Now, her husband works as a taxi driver, which meant presumably because he was self-employed and he couldn't operate his taxi, he had no income whatsoever. The next paragraph, Jane Tully, Director of External Affairs and Partnerships at the Money Advice Trust, the charity that runs the national debt line, said, We know that people on lower incomes are more likely to use cash. This can provide a degree of control for some people, particularly if they are on a very tight income, as that way they know where they are with their money week to week. So therefore, people on lower incomes, the use of cash becomes increasingly important as a budgeting tool. The next headline, are businesses legally obliged to take cash? We think, and of course this is Witch's view, this is the, the source for this article, we think it should be people's prerogative to pay with cash, whatever their reason for doing so. But there is no legal obligation for a business to accept it. It's the business owner's right to decide what payment methods they want to accept. So, we which think it should be people's prerogative or choice to pay with cash, but on the flip side, there's no legal obligation for businesses to accept it. This is an important point to remember. However, by not accepting or not offering certain payment methods, are business owners potentially reducing their sales? It could be said to be the case. Not everyone is aware of this, with confusion stemming from the fact that cash is often described as legal tender. This doesn't mean it's your legal right to use it in a shop. In fact, the Bank of England says that legal tender has a very narrow, narrow technical meaning to do with paying debts and actually has no real use in everyday life. Let's turn to page 7. However, with millions of people still reliant on or keen to use cash, it makes sense for businesses to make every effort to accept it. Now, as we mentioned earlier, which seem to be acting as consumer champion here rather than actually considering the views of business. It's not actually a legal obligation for businesses to accept it and we'll come on later on in the case study to see actually some negatives to business of accepting cash. The future of cash. The proportion of payments made in cash is falling. UK Finance says the figure halved from 46 to 23% between 2014 and 2019. But coins and notes are a long way from obsolete. The fact that it's halved is a significant drop, but nevertheless 23% is still over a fifth and therefore is a significant proportion. Between the 5% of people who told us they rely on cash and the 13% who would struggle without it, that is 10 million people not ready or able to give up cash. That's not to mention the 22 million people who say that cash is an essential backup. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that 10 plus 22 is of course a significant figure. Which welcomes the government's proposal for the FCA to be given the responsibility to oversee the protection of access to cash in the UK? But we, are, we are also calling on the government to make the regulator responsible for tracking the number of UK businesses accepting cash and the rate at which this is changing in order to determine what action is needed and when. So, which welcomes the government's proposal for the FCA to be given the responsibility to oversee the protection of access to cash in the UK, the FCA being the Financial Conduct Authority of course, in order to determine what action is needed and when. This sounds like which may be encouraging action to conserve the use of cash, i.e. potentially through legislation. The final line from which is that it's no good protecting people's access to cash if they have nowhere to spend it. 
This exaggerates and, and simplifies their position. At the end of the day, yes, we can put legislation into place protecting people's access to it, but if businesses aren't accepting it, really, we have to consider whether there's a point for it in the future. The final article considers that despite the reduction in cash, we are far from a cashless society. Going cashless, two new studies show how far along the UK is. Two new studies show how far the UK has come in embracing cashless payments, but underline how difficult it will be to realise a truly cash-free society. It's one of the most hotly discussed topics within finance, and two separate studies have now shed new light on our progress towards a cashless society. The latest cashless payments report from software recommendation engine Captera shows that more than 50% of UK consumers are paying with digital wallets. The main advantages cited are convenience, with the digital payments allowing people to leave their house without their bulky wallet. The survey beginning on page 8, also indicates that digital wallets are gaining penetration beyond just payments. Almost half, 48% of those who use them on a consistent basis, store their plane, train or bus tickets in a digital wallet, while a third, 33%, use them to store event tickets or their loyalty card. So, the software recommendation engine Captera um, had this report, and we could say that this resource source may be somewhat biased, of course, because Captera obviously have an interest in digital wallets, but it's worth considering and uh, mentioning that the main advantage cited is convenience, the big convenience of not having to take your big bulky wallet out with you. Now, the fact that payment cards as well as other cards are stored digitally significantly increases the convenience of, of course, the digital wallets. The second paragraph on page 8, the research underlines how the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the transition to cashless. Captera says that 86% of digital wallet users have started using them since the outbreak of the pandemic, while a further 19% of consumers are interested in using digital wallets for the first time in the future. So, a necessity during the pandemic was, of course, a cashless society. Many, many places did not accept cash at all due to the risk of spreading the virus. And it also says a further 19% of consumers are interested in using digital wallets for the first time in the future. This is almost 20%, almost a fifth of people. However, of course, even though this is a fifth of people, we do not have any information as to the methodology, how this information and these statistics were collected. Despite uptick in uptake, people still use cash. However, the findings do not necessarily show the huge amount of additional progress necessary in order to transition towards a cashless society. An analysis of bank ATM withdrawals from fintech platform Abound indicates that up to 65% of consumers still rely on cash withdrawals on a regular basis. More than 90% of those surveyed have used an ATM in the last six months, including nearly two-thirds, 65% of people, in the last month. That's according to data collected in November 2022. So ATM, of course, stands for Automated Teller Machine. And FinTech, what is a FinTech? Well, it's computer programs and other technology to support or enable banking and financial services. And Abound, which is a FinTech platform, is an AI, an artificial intelligence-driven lender, who use open banking to assess applications. It's worth just recapping what open banking is at this stage. More than 90% of those surveyed had used an ATM in the last six months. This is equivalent to 9 out of 10 people, which, as I'm sure you'll agree, is significant. It's a significant argument 
for cash being still used in society today. Abound, the fintech platform, claims that, despite the increasing popularity of cashless payment methods, the research shows how far away we are from becoming truly cashless. Only 5% of the population is living completely cash-free, the research claims. 5% of the population, obviously equivalent to 5 out of 100 people, is a very low percentage. Indeed, a bounds research shows both a regional and generational divide in the continuing use of cash. Londoners and young people were significantly less likely to use ATMs than their older counterparts, or those living outside the capital. Londoners and young people in particular, this suggests that the trend will continue as time goes on. The next subheading, the UK is still far from being a cashless society. At this stage, make sure you hit that subscribe button and that like button if you found this information useful. Gerald Chappell, CEO of Personal Lending Fintech Abound, says, while going contactless and paying with smartphones like Apple or Google Pay has become the default at many businesses since the coronavirus pandemic, our data indicates that cash remains extremely popular and in fact could be bouncing back. As the cost of living bites people's incomes, it could be that people may be using cash to reduce their spending. It's much easier to see physically where their money is going, continue on to page 9, as well as a natural rebound as people's lives return to normal following the pandemic. Of course, it is in Abound's interest if people are better able to budget their money as they are more likely to be paid back what they are owed. Abound of of course, being an AI-driven lender who use open banking to assess people's application. The source for that information is fintechmagazine.com. Fintech being the number one magazine website, newsletter and webinar service which cover fintech, banking, financial services, digital payments, technology and crypto amongst other things. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit the like button as well if you found this information useful. I'll see you in the next one.